This is Mark Tooley, editor of Providence, a journal of Christianity and American foreign policy with another episode of Marxism with fellow editors and fellow Marx, Mark Leibecki and Mark Melton. Today we'll touch on three or four pieces from Providence over the past week. Uh, the first of which is my interview with uh, British uh, theologian and scholar Nigel Bigger on uh, human rights, on uh, Presbyterian Church in America, pastor and theologian James Wood's piece uh, defending sort of Christian nationalism, a piece by uh, our revered uh, patron saint Reinhold Niebuhr on the imperative of uh, helping enemies uh, in the aftermath of World War II, and then finally a piece that our own Mark Melton did reviewing a book on the 1970s, 1980s troubles in Northern Ireland. But first, we'll start with uh, Nigel Bigger, whose new book is What's Wrong with Rights? Uh, and in my interview with Nigel Bigger at Oxford, he says that he is responding to uh, critics, uh, Christian critics of human rights who believe the concept is overly individualistic and uh, minimizes the needs of the wider community. So he admits there are some obviously misunderstandings about human rights in contemporary Western society, but defends the basic premise uh, rooted uh, in Jewish and Christian teaching, but also much wider than that, as he specifies. And if I understood him correctly, he would date human rights uh, to uh, the Middle Ages in terms of how we currently understand them. But Mark Levecki, you studied under and with the great Nigel Bigger. What were your thoughts about his comments? Yeah, 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 wonderful conversation, important book. Uh, important to remember, as I think Nigel points out in your interview, you know, what's wrong with rights does have a question mark. So he's exploring, he's exploring and is an open question, obviously he has his position. Uh, one of the things I have long admired about Nigel is that uh, he he rarely, if ever, goes on, an, on, a, on a sort of uh, ideological diatribe. Uh, I think throughout the book, throughout your interview, he models what what sort of a nuanced, um, fair analysis of a of a controversial subject looks like. Uh, and so he he doesn't present him as an anti right ideologue. Uh, but, but he is concerned about a number of things. And the one that I found um, maybe most interesting, uh, both in the book and in the interview, is that his concern that rights talk has touched very often crowds out uh, both virtue talk uh, and virtuous action. In that in a given situation, if I, if I too strenuously harp upon my own rights, I can do so in a way that's not just uh, uncharitable, uh, but in a way that demands uh, other people make sacrifices uh, that are, are beyond the pale. Uh, I might insist that I have a right to education and that that education should be paid for by the government. Uh, and I can insist on that all day long, uh, but at some point, charity would demand that I figure out or at least reflect upon if I get this right met, uh, where's the money gonna come from? What else can't the government do if they're if they're spending money on these rights? And so his his larger analysis is that rights talk very often is done in a way uh, that it promotes uh, self centeredness and an other sacrifice, um, and and that's a problem. A society that cares only for rights can abandon things like generosity and charity and prudence and forgiveness, uh, and um, and that's a problem. I should point out that Mark Levecki is addressing us from his uh, Florida hotel balcony overlooking presumably the Atlantic Ocean. So uh, his picture is a little bit choppy, but we can hear him clearly. Mark Melton, uh, you reviewed oh. a book on uh, Northern Ireland's uh, troubles. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. 
Right. So this is a book that really looks into a specific murder that happened um, that the IRA later admitted to doing. And not only was this woman a mother of 10 murdered, she was disappeared, which is considered a war crime. And uh, so the book kind of like focuses in on that murder, but the people involved were part of what was known as the unknowns of the IRA. And there was a special squad and uh, they would, uh, you know, execute people and uh, do very clandestine operations. And one of those members was actually this woman who uh, carried out a bombing in uh, London. I think it was the first bombing in London. And she was convicted, uh, went to jail, did a hunger strike, got out of it. Her sister continued to do IRA activities. In fact, she was arrested in 2009 or sometime for a bombing in, or a shooting in 2009 that the IRA did. And so in this story of like talking about these characters, it stretches the whole breadth of the, the you know, most recent troubles of like, you know, the IRA from like the 1960s, 70s, 80s, and then briefly into like the Good Friday Agreement and a couple of things more recently. And uh, so, yeah, this is probably, I think one of the more interesting history books I've read lately. Um, it uses like a narrative history. So it does like scenes that um, are very detailed. It reads almost like a story. And so I kind of, I said, it's like not very many writers can turn a 450 history, a 450 page history book into a bingeable read. Um, I think this could be uh, interesting material for a uh, you know HBO type series. I think you would have to have like three or four seasons to really get a good um, representation of it. But it does focus in on the IRA a lot. It doesn't talk about the loyalist militias very much at all, and just because of the nature of what it was covering. And uh, but it does talk about some things that the British state did. Like basically, the British state was using uh, tactics they developed in Kenya. Um, and using in against insurgencies against its own British subjects in Ireland or Northern Ireland. So uh, I've always found uh, the how nations or how conflicts amongst uh, people in the same country can develop and how do you get to a point where you were kind of together at a certain point and then you just start killing each other. And I find that fascinating topic. And this is a good example of that. And uh, so yeah, I highly recommend the book. Well, on a somewhat related topic, uh, James Wood, the Presbyterian minister, not the actor, uh, wrote a column for us, a, a qualified defense of Christian nationalism, which has become a major boogeyman, uh, justifiably so, given some of the extremisms present in our current moment. But uh, Wood defends the concept of uh, a certain form of nationalism, a loyalty to the nation state and a understanding of special duties and responsibilities to those neighbors to whom we are most uh, proximate and that Christians should cherish and nurture their own societies. Uh, some basic points in sync with uh, the overall themes of uh, providence, don't you think, Mark Lebecki? I didn't hear all the question. I've got uh, a lot of background noise. So apologies if I'm uh, shooting in the dark and I miss completely, but um, we're going to read. Well, in terms of uh, Christian nationalism, uh, James Wood wrote a qualified defense of it in terms of, uh, yes, Christians can be nationalists of a certain sort in terms of uh, cherishing and nurturing their own societies and wishing well for those to whom they are most proximate. Yeah. Absolutely. I agree with that completely. I think that follows in what, uh, you know, the best stuff that I've seen in Joshua Mitchell's uh, analysis, right? In that, um, you know, nation comes from uh, natio, uh, natality, uh, places of birth. Uh, it is, uh, it would be anathema, I think, not to have, uh, you know, the minimum feelings of warmth toward one's kin uh, and kith. Uh, that is appropriate. I think we have special obligations as human beings, not just, uh, not just permission uh, to care for our proximate neighbors, but a special obligation to care for those who uh, are our own. As a father, I have a special obligation to my children. Um, as a neighbor, I have a special obligation to those in my neighborhood, and, and those obligations radiate out from there. If I can't be faithful and loyal uh, to the people nearest me, it seems far more difficult to expect that I could be um, generous and, and charitable toward those further off. Now that's qualified. Again, if I'm in apartheid South Africa, if I'm in the slave holding South, if I'm in Nazi Germany, 
then those obligations uh, look very different. Uh, but I would still contest that those are obligations. So even in Nazi Germany, uh, because I love my nation, I want the best for my nation. I want my nation to flourish. Nations can only flourish in particular ways, not any old way. And so my special obligation to Nazi Germany is still existent. It just looks a little bit different. It would take the form of resistance and take the form of protest, things like that. So he's absolutely right um, to stress uh, the importance of that. And those who continue uh, both within and without the church to insist that that is a, a uh, that's a binary choice that has to be made between nationalism and and globalism uh, continue to miss the point. I get that a lot of it is still semantic. Uh, we are now talking about nationalism the way we used to talk about patriotism, but I'm, I'm increasingly convinced that nationalism as a term has a useful place because patriotism, I think, uh, and again, some of this is semantics, but patriotism is very often sort of the, the occasional roughly symbolic uh, zeal one shows toward one's homeland, 4th of July, national holidays, the Super Bowl, things like this. Uh, but I think there's something deeper uh, that is very much grounded uh, in nationhood and what that looks like. So I thought it was, I think he's spot on. Well, speaking of nationhood and Nazi Germany, we posted a short piece mm -hmm. that Reinhold Niebuhr wrote in 1946, uh, obviously in the aftermath of World War II, when uh, Germany is uh, prostrate, our former enemy, and urges the imperative of uh, feeding a potentially starving Germany, though they had been an enemy nation who had inflicted great suffering on Europe and the world. Nonetheless, Niebuhr saw the uh, imperative of uh, feeding these defeated um, enemies. Tell us a little bit about this piece, Mark Melton. Right, so this piece came out in January, 1946. The, you know, Reinhold Niebuhr had already written about some of the situation, I believe in like even December or November, I don't remember the exact dates, but we ran um, some similar pieces of that last year. But the idea is, you know, after the war, you have these forced migrations, you have people starving in winter, uh, you know, not having clothing and from bombed out cities and whatnot that you would expect in the type of total war that happened in Europe at that time. And so in this, he's basically saying that even though public opinion was against the idea of giving this food to the Germans, that it needed to be done anyways. It's like the right thing to do. And so he quotes the scripture of, you know, when thy, you know, what is it? The, you know, if thy enemy is hunger, hungry, feed him. And if he's thirsty, give him drink. And in that, you know, it's a simple message. It's pretty basic. It's actually not a very long piece at all, but it's sometimes a, the simplest command is sometimes very difficult to follow. And uh, another kind of context in this, you might look at this as, you know, a pacifist message of like, well, if that enemy is hungry, then, you know, fight him. It's like, no, like he's still saying you fought them and defeated them, but you still have responsibilities to that person as a human being, as an image bearer of God. And so that's kind of the context of this article. Mark Lebecca, you're always anxious to discuss Reinhold Niebuhr. What are your thoughts? Yeah, yeah, he, he, it was a great article. I mean, it's a three-minute read, as, as Melton's alluded to, and it is so packed with things that could be discussed either, you know, in a seminary classroom, in an ethics course, in a pub, whatever. So for me, there's a couple things. One is the connect, I think, that's being made, that can be made between this short three-minute article and your interview with Nigel Bigger, because one, one of the points that Nigel discusses is that if you have a right to something, if somebody makes a rights claim, uh, especially if it's a legal right claim, then that has to insist that somebody else that we can point to has a duty responsibility, has, has a requirement to fulfill uh, that right, to meet the terms of that right. So one of the examples that Nigel uses, I think in his book, maybe not in the interview, is to discuss the idea of universal subsistence, that it's noble to say that everyone in the world has the right to subsist uh, but to make that a legal claim becomes complicated because that then insists that there's somebody to whom we can point and say, you have obligation to meet. Whereas if you approach it from the perspective of a, then you can abandon some of that requirement and you just make it a universal responsibility of those who have the means or those who can cultivate 
bathe them, you know, to, to serve and touch on, to feed them, to water them, etc. And, and so government America, because we have a food surplus, now has a responsibility commensurate with that to, to feed our, our fallen enemy. Uh, and I, I think he's right on that. And when we talk about what enemy love looks like, uh, it looks in part like something like that, uh, where even people that have been defeated, uh, we still have a responsibility to put them back together. And the, Eric Patterson has done a lot on, on post-war uh, justice, use post-bellum, and there's a lot to be said to this. Um, one of the things that I do want to point out is that it's, it's, it's an interesting historic context, right? And Niebuhr, I think, misses something that I think is important. He asks, why is it that, that Germany is starving? And he gives a number of reasons. He talks about the decimation of German industry by the Allies. He talks about uh, the destruction of, of transportation systems in Germany by the Allies. He talks about the dismantling of the industrial equipment in Germany for reparations imposed upon them by the Allies. Um, he talks about the forced migration of Germans from uh, Eastern Europe back into Germany and the, the burden that that places on an already decimated system in Germany. He lists a bunch of factors. It's important to remember that actually the reason Germany is starving is because Nazi Germany embarked insisted upon, let's say, the prompt and utter destruction of Germany in order to bring about the end of the war. So it's important to remember why the people are starving. And that Nazi Germany as a regime was responsible not just for the first order consequences of their actions, but the second order, the third order, the fourth order, etc. cetera. Um, it's also curious to remember that German uh, actions against occupied lands during the war led to the starvation of millions of Soviets and thousands of, uh, tens of thousands of others. Something like 2 million Soviet POWs died in starvation because Germany redirected food supplies to Germany. So now the people who are starving are, are people who had forced the starvation upon others throughout the war. And yet Niebuhr still insists we have a responsibility and a moral duty uh, to care for them. And so I think especially in the context of the times, uh, however much you wanna distinguish between the German people and the Nazi government, uh, history remains a complicating factor. And it must have been a profound uh, in position to insist upon the West having just fought a war, having just sacrificed blood and treasure and the lives of their children to end Nazism, to then go to them and say, we have to feed these people, which of course uh, we did. And, and historians are, are confident that we saved millions of lives in Germany by doing this. So I think just packed into that little piece is an incredible analysis of what Christian responsibility in the world can look like. An important point uh, in 1946 and today and always, loving our enemies. Mark Lavecki, Mark Melton, thank you for another episode of Marxism. Until next week, and Mark Lavecki, enjoy South Florida. I'll do my best.